the the pace of joining is picking up. <laughs> All right, this is Don. Can people hear me okay? Yes, sir. Thank you. Can you hear me? This is John. Yes, we can hear you, John. Thank you. Okay, so it's 401. Marion, why don't we go ahead and call the meeting to order? Um, do you want to take a quick ro roll call of commissioners just so we have it for the record? Sure. So roll call, um, Commissioner Alter. Here. Commissioner Beals. Uh, Don Beals here. And Commissioner Robert Gilday. I'm here. Thank you. Commissioner uh, John Newman. I'm here. And Commissioner Ben Rudel. And Ben said he was going to be here. He's probably just running late. I know he teaches at NAU, so. And Joe Loveridge. And Commissioner Kurt. So we're only right now we're only uh, missing Loveridge. OK, everyone is present. OK, great. Thank you so much. So let's move to item two on the agenda. It's approval of the amendment. Now the minutes from June 16, 2022. Does anybody have any questions uh, or changes to the minutes that were issued by Mary and the team? Um, I have a question. This is John. About uh, if we there is an update on the ADEQ testing for P for PFOAs and PFASs in wells and wildcat reclaimed water, uh, and if uh, that can be talked about at this meeting or in future meetings. OK, but John, just to be clear, you don't have any correction to the minutes themselves. No, this, I just okay. I just okay. they, they said that uh, testing had been done and uh, they were going to report the results when we got them. So I was just kind of asking for an update. OK, all right, let's let's put a pin in that for a minute and just get through the process of approving the minutes. Sure. And so if anybody if there's no other um, addendums or changes to the minutes. If I could have a motion to approve the minutes. I'll move to approve the minutes. This is John Thank Nauman. So. Thank you, John. Any second? Robert Dilday, second. Thank you, Robert. Uh, all those for say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, great. So we have approved the minutes. Um, OK, let's move into section three and then John will hit your part at back in, I think, in the informational items. OK, so we'll, we'll sure. circle back to that. No problem. I hate to use that phrase, but let's. <laughs> OK, <laughs> so, so yeah, sorry. Section three, public participation. So public participation enables the public to address the commission about an item that is not on the agenda. If you wish to address the commission, please state your name, address for the record. Arizona open meeting law prohibits the commission from discussing or taking action on an item which is not listed on the prepared agenda. The commission commission members may, however, respond to criticism made by those addressing the commission, ask staff to review a matter, or ask that a matter be placed on a future agenda. Please, public comments should be limited to three minutes regarding time. So are there any public comments participation at this point in time?
Um, may I, as a commissioner, <laughs> make a public comment as a member of the public? You you can, yeah, as you put your public, your member of the public hat on, you certainly may. Okay, um, so I am Ben Ruddle, um, ordinary citizen, not commissioner for the purpose of this comment. Um, so I just wanted to um, point out what we are, what is not on our agenda this week, um, which is massive water cuts, uh, political fighting about a water crisis, about drought management, um, fights about which businesses are going to lose their water and go out of business and lose their revenue employees, um, which communities have to stop growing uh, or which neighborhoods. Um, those things are not on our agenda this week, like they are on the agenda of half of the other communities in our state um, and many in our region. And I just want to applaud um, the, the, the leaders of the community, um, both elected and unelected, and especially those who have quietly um, put in place some really solid financial um, and water sustainability plans uh, for, the, for the community's water resources over the past 20 years. Uh, because Flagstaff is sitting in great shape right now, and it did not have to be this way. Um, we, we could be uh, having problems if not for the good choices uh, that we as a community have made. Um, so I just want to applaud that and, and point out um, the, the really what I view as a huge success of the community's water management. Um, and I, I really think, based on what I see, um, that we are set up for continued success in the future. We're, we're not without challenges, but um, we, we do have a clear path forward for a sustainable water supply. Um, so that's that's really great news. All right, I'm finished. Thank you, Mr. Riel. Any other public statements? Um, I'll make a public statement also as a citizen of Flagstaff. Um, I just want to thank Aaron for arranging the trip to Scottsdale. Uh, as a community member um, uh, and to go and see uh, the operation down there was exceptional. Uh, I learned a lot and uh, of what can be done. So just wanted to thank Aaron for making the arrangements for that trip. Yeah, I second that. That was a very enlightening trip and very well executed. So thank you, Aaron. Any other comments? Okay, then let's, with that, we'll close out public participation and move into item 4A, which is a storm water utility rate adjustment update from Ed Shank. So Ed, please proceed. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, Ed Shank, stormwater manager here at the city. Uh, just going to give a very brief update. We did have a meeting uh, between city finance, uh, water services, and our consultant for the stormwater rate update, uh, water resources economics. Uh, with that meeting, this was uh, about two weeks ago, we were able to move forward our financial model for stormwater. Uh, this is driven partly by deficiencies, our capital improvement program falling so far behind, uh, but then also for the most part being driven by uh, this post fire flood environment that we are in, both with the 2019 museum fire and now with the 2022 uh, pipeline fire. Um, so water resources economics, uh, they, they are not able to make it today. Um, we will have a more substantive uh, update for the commission uh, in August at the August meeting. Um, but there was a request to report out um, at least some of the preliminary uh, work that's going on just to give um, some idea to the commissioners of where we're going with this. Um, so uh, as you may know or may not know, uh, Stormwater is funded through its own utility rate through the ERUs, the equivalent residential 
uh, unit um, factor, the so ERU, through impervious surfaces, so through the GIS exercise, uh, the data that's run through that. Uh, our current rate of $3.74 per ERU was set in 2018 uh, and was largely set or, or changed, I should say, from prior rates uh, based on the Rio de Flag flood control project and the, the debt servicing that we, the city, were taking on uh, due to that flood control project. Um, so at that time, we, we had, like I said, $3.74. Uh, for today's dollars, that is about 1.4 million for stormwater operational budget, about 700,000 for uh, per year for a capital improvement project, and most of the rest goes towards debt servicing for the Rio de Flag. Um, our preliminary model results, uh, and the reason why I'm here talking about today, uh, we're showing the need of approximately $1 million extra within the operational budget. Uh, we still do not have numbers for the capital improvements, but I expect that to come in quite a bit higher than 700,000 a year, uh, especially with much needed projects within the pipeline fire affected area, the museum fire affected area, as well as our deficiencies uh, within uh, prior master planning. So most notably Northeast area master drainage study that was completed in uh, 2009 and 2010. Uh, so just a quick update, more just a heads up that uh, more is going to be coming in August. Um, but just to let you know, the numbers are going to be pretty large um, in terms of need. Uh, we are trying to show this to council later this year um, as a tiered approach. So it'll be a level of service uh, where they want option A, B, C, or you know D will probably be uh, a no change uh, kind of option, uh, stay in the course. Uh, but with all two or three options of level of service, uh, we do expect that they will be substantially higher than what we have right now. Um, so just update, if there's any questions, um, I can either take them or convey them to our consultant, uh, questions or comments. Otherwise, uh, I am done on this subject. Any questions, Fred? Uh, yep. This is, oh, go ahead. No, after you. All right. Um, this is not a question. Um, this is a comment, and it's a it's a comment for the general record. Um, expenses. I, I think I think it's clear, um, if not in a legal sense, um, then then from simple common sense and a sense of fairness, and and also common law, that the people who caused uh, the fire and those who allowed the fire to propagate into a disaster through negligence of their property should be the ones paying for the city and its residents to mitigate flood problems. I think this is obvious. Um, we don't know necessarily who started the fires, but we do know that it's the U.S. federal government um, and more specifically, the U.S. Forest Service um, that has been negligent in its management of the forest lands. Um, these fires have burned through heavily overgrown forest that hasn't been managed correctly for decades. We have known that for decades. Um, that's been acknowledged through um, recent funding to prevent exactly this type of event. Uh, but the funding is too little and too late. Um, so for the record, I just want to I want to put my view on the record that um, the city is owed a substantial and ongoing uh, reparation by the federal government and possibly by others. And we should not be paying for this um, out of our tax base. Um, John Nauman. Um... I would like to know uh, uh, maybe in August um, what kind of interaction there's been between the city, the county, and the Forest Service um, in terms of future planning. Um, uh, I, I agree there's been some Forest Service policies, and I would say in the use of uh, the forests uh, around Flagstaff and in the watersheds, and in the uh, drainages that run into Flagstaff, 
uh, allowing folks to camp overnight in certain areas of the forest. Uh, we need to rethink that whole thing about camping in the vicinity of drainages and watersheds for Flagstaff and um, establish new policies. I, don't, I really don't think we should allow camping in the areas where those fires were started. Up on Freeland Prairie Road, there's camping a lot in that area. It should not be there. So the city, the county need, need to work with the Forest Service and establish a new policy. Um, maybe day use, maybe non-motorized use, other avenues to keep it open for recreation. We could have to we could look at the statistics for who starts fires. I don't know how many mountain bikers or hikers start fires for day hiking. I think it's pretty dang low, but we need to look at data and set new policy to remove camping out of these areas, uh, which are the major major causes of fire in June and May and June when we have these problems. So just some thinking about that. And specifically, I'm worried about the drainage in Schultz Creek and especially the intersection of Schultz Creek at 180. And I think that's being looked at right now, but I, I just hope it's addressed in the sh very short term instead of the long term. So thank you. Thanks, John. Malcolm, I, I've got some comments on what you asked, John, but Malcolm, go ahead. Yeah, um, I know we're going to talk about the county at the end, but uh, the other commissioner's discussion kind of, I don't know, maybe it, it triggered something in that I know that uh, Lucinda wants to spend all of the flood control district money on on forest management, which I mean, if that had been done, it certainly would have lessened uh, the fire uh, post fire flooding. Um, I also know the county has bragged a lot about uh, matching funds from the federal government for the forest treatments. So I guess my thought is, is there any opportunity for the city of Flagstaff to get uh, to get any matching funds for improvements, um, structural improvements on the watersheds? If they're matching funds with the county for forest management or for forest thinning, I guess it really is. Is there any lobbying that can be done? Is there any way the federal government can step up and give us some funds for structural improvements? Uh, I know, uh, yeah, it's just a thought. I don't know if it's just a thought. Yeah, do you have any thoughts on that at this point? Was that directed to me? I'm sorry, I don't know who that question was. Well, well yeah, I, so what I would say is, um, let, let me make, this is Kurt, let me make a quick comment. So. It, Ed and I and Brad were also going back and forth and actually had extended an invitation to the county uh, to, to show, to be at the meeting. And I just don't think they had, had enough lead time um, to do a couple of things. One is to coordinate what you know, with, with the, and we'll kind of hit a later topic, but to coordinate the county just doubled the stormwater tax uh, and Flagstaff will now contribute twice as much, which is going to be up in the number of 5 million. So as we go into a rate study, I think it's imperative that we all understand what we're, what they're going to do, what we're going to do, so there's not duplication or gaps, so that we're being as effective as possible in, in what we think we have to do. Along with that, though, I think we also have to, what you were talking about, Mountain, go back and take a look at, is there a way for us to get matching funds to help supplement this? Because you know, the, we could always triple the rates, but if there's federal money that should really be applied here, that is the right thing to do for our customer base, our constituents, right? So we we need to get, and I don't, Vice Mayor Sweet is not on. I was having a discussion with her about um, having her sort of lend her name to our thrust to get connected with the county. And it sounds like we probably should add one more group to that, which is the Forest Service, so that we are all on the same page, literally. Um, so I'll, I'll talk to her about that offline, about trying to, to, to wrangle a meeting between all three and then 
and offline, I mean, Brad, myself, Ed, and, and with her, and then we can report back if if we can successfully get a meeting together. Yeah, does that make sense, Ed? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And, and, and just to clarify a little bit, um, you know, there there has been some expenditures of both the Forest Service, the federal government, um, as well as the county within the city. Uh, you know, for so ex for example, last year with Museum Fire, uh, the Forest Service um, chief was out here, the chief of the entire Forest Service. Um, the county did receive, well, not the county, but $3.5 million were put on, on forest measures to help with that museum fire area, so Spruce Wash watershed. And the county has also received another $3.5 million out of RCS. Um, one of the other topics we're going to talk about today is, is also related, and it would be NRCS money, so also uh, Department of Agricultural agriculture sorry money um that that we are hoping to receive um so there is some some federal assistance out there um and we, you know obviously we we go after fema grants and etc so it's it's not like we're going it alone um but i mean there always could be more I mean, it's not really my place to to explain or, or go through that but i do understand the the comments there and, and the questions as well um i think that's not really my role to to answer on that from a policy level but um yeah there's there's definitely more discussion that could be had agree agree any other questions or comments for ed i would i would just agree with the comments made that we should really look for other sources of funding to supplement uh, increases in uh, water rate structures. This is John. John, can you uh, can you elaborate on that? I'm not sure what, what you meant. Well, I think there, I mean, there are so many sources, of, different sources of funding out there that the city can partner with uh, the county and the Forest Service. Um, uh, it, even the state may have some release and disaster funds. I'm not sure about that. Um, that, uh, you know, and it would allow us to use some of those funds instead of uh, increasing the storm water rates as much or uh, get more bang from our buck from any increases that we do have. So I'm not really up to speed on the grants in this area. So I, I just think I would. Uh, encourage that kind of thinking yes okay i thought you were saying the opposite so that's why i asked to elaborate so that's great thanks i think we all agree money from other sources is better than from our customers so yes you're here any other any other questions comments for ed i got i have what this is robert dilde if uh we recoup some of our firefighting costs in the past and other damages that uh, not only the federal government, but the state and other entities would participate in. Then we have a historical um, path to go back on. I don't know if our city attorney does it or who does it, but wouldn't that be a good thing to get started? Because uh, I'm sure whatever worked in the past would work again. So I suggest we look into that. Thank you. Yep, understood. Okay, any more comments? Uh, yeah, I just put my hand up. This is Sterling Solomon, your city attorney. I'd be happy to look into that if the commission wills us to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Sterling. Yeah, I think that would be worthwhile. I, oh, there it is. I just uh, I'm I'm having to cruise up and down the list here to see the hands. So, <laughs> no problem. Okay. No problem. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that would make sense. Um, and there's another issue, maybe if you're on at the end, we can ask you about to, to investigate as well, but um, around the county and fees. But okay, all right. So let's. Uh, any any other questions for Ed? No? Okay. Well, thank you very much Ed, for that was a great update and obviously uh, on top of everybody's minds. So let's move to item 4B, which is the 2022 drought contingency plan and draft five-year drought contingency plan. And this is going to be 
introduced by Aaron Young. So Aaron. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. I, and to uh, Chairman Ruddle's comment on drought contingency planning, um, fortunately, we have something on the agenda that is looking out a ways and, and not because we're, we're in dire straits right now. Um, so let me pull up my presentation. Um, and was uh, Gary Miller's question uh, seen in the chat? Chairman? No, I don't think so. Oh, looks like he has a follow up question for Mr. Alter. OK, Gary, did you want to? Did you have a question still? There it goes. Try to click those buttons a couple times. Um, I don't know that it's still applicable, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, Malcolm, I was a little confused when you were talking about those other sources of funding um, or partnering or, or federal matching dollars. Were you asking that the county contribute that matching portion or that the county or flood control district rather uh, advocate on our behalf to pursue those federal matching dollars? So that, maybe a minor distinction, but that I was I was a little confused by what you were trying to ask. Uh, thanks, Gary. Uh, actually, neither. Um, I understand the county flood control district has been successful in leveraging matching funds for forest management. I was just wondering if there's any way that we can leverage some funds and I don't know from whom, but no, it wasn't specifically from them. I mean, I know we're going to talk about it at the end, but just I was wondering if there were other opportunities that could be identified other than that. That was just an example. OK. Yeah, and I'll just share from my experience being relatively new in stormwater. Um, I've been really impressed with all of the opportunities that stormwater does pursue. So I, I hope that's some reassurance that we are always looking for uh, other opportunities, uh, financial resources, matching dollars to pursue those types of projects. So if that's any type of assurance, I just wanted to make that comment. Thanks. Thank you. OK, Aaron, please proceed. Thank you, Chairman, and I'd like to uh, welcome Council Member House to this meeting. I think it might be your first meeting, um, and maybe you're here uh, in place of Vice Mayor Sweet, but uh, welcome. Uh, my presentation today is a proposal to the Water Commission for, the, for us to develop a City of Flagstaff drought con contingency plan. Let me put this in presentation mode. We have pieces of a drought contingency plan. Oh, shoot. Let's see here. One second. I have to swap. Uh, I'm going to end my slideshow so that I can still see my slides. Is this OK, what you're seeing? You yeah, should I, see I can. I can see it fine. Anybody else have okay. a, anybody have an issue with visual? Perfect. Looks, looks good. So we have pieces of a drought contingency plan. It's in our city code and our uh, 2014 water policies. Uh, but based on that policy, it does require or suggest the city has a drought contingency plan. Uh, Bureau of Reclamation scoring criteria on their water smart grants on many of them requires a board approved drought contingency plan. I believe it might be a requirement for active management areas in uh, Arizona. Uh, so most of the Valley cities have one. We do not. So I am proposing uh, providing a draft five year plan to the Water Commission for review uh, before the August meeting um, and getting that ready over however many meetings we need uh, to put a plan in front of city council. Uh, I'll walk through uh, pieces of the water policy and code just so you're a little more familiar with, with that. So our policy D7 on drought planning, 
um, mentions that our renewable water supplies are, can be impacted by short-term and long-term changes in regional climate. Uh, therefore, the city will maintain a drought contingency plan within its water conservation ordinance in order to establish policies, rules, and penalties to be implemented when a water deficiency condition has been declared. Within the policy uh, D71, uh, the plan should do these five things, and I've highlighted the three that I feel um, we're unable to do because we don't have a formal drought contingency plan. Uh, additionally, policies seven two, D72 and D73, um, I've highlighted things that are not addressed, uh, such as allowing uh, council to provide periodic updates or amending the plan. Uh, so adopting a five-year plan would do that, as, as well as um, considering defining triggers based upon hy uh, hydrology, supply lim limitations such as uh, the lake level. Um, I'll talk about uh, D73B. Uh, we do have triggers in city code that are based upon our infrastructure limitations. Uh, drought contingency planning occurs throughout other elements of our water policy, uh, discussing, you know, maximizing the use of our renewable water supplies is an important management tool, um, providing uh, a diverse renewable water supply portfolio, such as, you know, securing Red Gap Ranch as a future option as well as aquifer recharge and recovery, which is, you know, the uh, application for the Water Smart grant is to fund exactly that for Flagstaff. Um, the policy points to developing uh, local water recharge and recovery initiatives. Again, uh, the application to the Bureau of Reclamation touches on all of these items as well as we should remain engaged, informed, and involved in statewide and regional discussions regarding groundwater use, recharge, and recovery, which we do, um, in addition to water reuse. So in our city code, we do have the um, flexibility of uh, elevating out of a water availability strategy level one, which we're always in, which is just water awareness. That's our odd even watering days. We have some control um, on uh, attenuating, you know, our, our peak water demand in the summer through the odd even watering days. We have a water waste ordinance um, elevating to a level two emergency that has uh, we've only done that one time since the code was adopted in 1990 or 1989, and that was in 2002 into 2003. The criteria to go from a level one to a level two is based on uh, what we refer to as our safe production capability um, compared to our total production capability. So every year in our annual report to the Water Commission, our water production team pledges how much uh, million gallons a day, you know, we can produce from our water sources and we total those up. Our safe production capability is if 90% uh, of the total is compromised. That can happen from a wildfire in the inner basin. So now I've just struck out the two MGD that we have available from wells and springs in the inner basin. That puts our safe production capability at this time at 17.2 uh, million gallons a day. And just um, uh, for comparison, the highest peak demand we've seen in the summer over the last 10 year period was 12.9 million gallons a day in, in 2013. Um, simple math, uh, if we were to lose Upper Lake Mary Reservoir uh, to a wildfire or if, uh, you know, like the transmission line was to break, um, we would compromise our 90% safe production capability and our demand could exceed what uh, we can supply. Therefore, uh, the, the utility director, water services director with our city manager could implement level two emergency. 
Um, our safe production capability in 2002 was reduced to 9.8 MGD when we lost uh, uh, Upper Lake Mary. It basically went dry and we were having to um, drill emergency wells. Pretty tough situation. And we had some of our top production wells go down at the same time. We've done a lot since then to build redundancy. Um, however, uh, the drought contingency strategies um, or a drought contingency plan got me thinking about um, this in terms of, you know, making sure we meet the criteria in our water policies. It's not only a surface water supply shortage that could impact our ability to provide water that, to the community, it's also wildfire impacts. So what are those things we can do to um, mitigate uh, uh, mitigate um, issues supplying water to our community if like our Woody Mountain well field were to be taken out? So um, for instance, we could build 3.4 million gallons a day in our inner city wells. Um, the well that we're proposing at Canyon Del Rio is an inner city well. It's away from a wildfire. Um, it's not part of a single line to the city like our 10 wells at Woody Mountain are. So it's sort of um, a drought, uh, a, a, a drought protected uh, well. Um, Let's see here, securing Red Gap Ranch as a future groundwater source. We we just purchased the right of way. That was a huge um, security uh, item for us to accomplish uh, just so we can just so we have the option for that as as a supply and also taking this opportunity before we need it to explore it as a regional water supply. Uh, there might be opportunities for for funding with other partners. Bureau of Reclamation uh, might have opportunities. So again, we wanna leave all doors open and do what we can for security. Um, plan for maximizing water reuse, continue with our portable reuse master plan, uh, pursuing advanced treatment uh, pilot projects. So the Bureau of Reclamation I understand should be providing funding. Um, I'd love to submit for a grant and having a drought contingency plan uh, will help us score higher on our application. And then we have a number of best management practice will continue, practices that will continue the AWWA annual water audit, uh, just uh, increasing groundwater production efficiency where we can, distribution efficiencies, and uh, executing our water conservation strategic plan. So uh, here are some ideas for in our five-year drought contingency plan where I would like input from the Water Commission, um, perhaps in August, uh, some ideas I've listed here. And um, with that, I would like uh, to open it for discussion and, and just wondering uh, if the commission would like me to pursue this. That's all I have and glad to take questions. Yeah, I've, I've got a, this is Kurt here, and i got a question, but anybody else have a question first? Um, I do have some questions, but I'll, I'll go ahead. Okay, so, so Aaron, my, I'm, I'm a little confused about why we need th this as opposed to, because I, I think that we would look into the future and say, we have a we have a strategic water supply plan that should be looking to maximize the port options in our portfolio, right? So Red Gap Ranch, re reclaim water, excuse me, recycled water, our wells, everything. So it should look at it should be just a very active look at everything that's a potential source. With that, we also have a plan on conservation, which is let's make sure we're being efficient in our usage, and then we have a very efficient plan on sewage and how we how we could potentially in the future produce reclaimed and, and DPR. So what what is, this seems like this would just be part of our normal plan. It's already should be living in our plan that we're doing really active management of the of the inbound water portfolio sources. So help, help me understand how this fits. Maybe I'm just being dense, which is- No, you know, 
high option. I, I actually uh, kind of felt that way as well. You know, folks are like, oh, does Flagstaff have a drought contingency plan? I'm like, well, we have things in place in city code that if we have a water shortage, we can implement. But when I dug when I dug into it, uh, we don't have a plan that um, does letter E here has clear procedures on how the plan will be implemented, including provisions for informing the public. That's one piece we don't have. Um, we also, there are there are more um, situations than just Upper Lake Mary going dry, including, you know, this great wildfire potential we have. And I think it's really important that we have a, a an action plan for we've you know how much volume of water we've lost um and how it triggers what's in city code um this is also an opportunity to consider de defining triggers based on um hyd hydrologic supply limitations if you know we're, we use so much groundwater we could uh then go to uh you know maybe a stage um 1b or something where uh, water is a lot more expensive for the community and and we're limiting outdoor water use something like that um so it's really our opportunity to um, manage withdrawals from the aquifer withdrawals from upper lake mary where uh, our other plans don't do that so um yeah and I the bureau of reclam oh go ahead. go ahead no go ahead, go ahead. Well, not having, oh, Brad has his hand up and he actually drafted all these policies and pushed them through. So I'd love to hear from him. Well, I guess, let me finish one point. I, I guess where I get a little hung up is, I think to me, almost drought plan is too limiting. What I just heard you say is, let's really think through all the different potential water supply issues, drought, fire, wells going dry, it, which may, may, or may or may not be drought related. And, and put in place procedures and plans that if we lose 10%, if we lose 20%, if we lose 30%, you know, what do we do? To me, that's, I think we need to look at that as just a, a strategic plan, regardless of whether it's drought triggered or not. But that's that's where I kind of think we should go, but I'll, I'll, I'll listen to others. <laughs> So, so thank you. So Brad Hill, your interim water services director. So as Aaron mentioned, you know, we put these together eight years ago and I'm trying to dust off the cobwebs of why some of these were put in there. And I was intimately involved in developing these. And really, I think an, a, another way to help share this, what Aaron was describing was that what this drought contingency plan does is relies on these other planning efforts meaning whether it's the water conservation it's the water resource if once we have a water reuse a uh, water infrastructure brings all of those together and then it helps to provide a communication tool for when certain triggers and elements happen it brings the, it, it kind of brings elements of all those plans together uh, uh, under the guise of a drought contingency effort, so it's not just one. It's not just one or another. It's a it's a culmination of all of these. So, hopefully, that helps. One more thing, if I could add, you know, when we go to the Bureau of Reclamation for funding to do reuse, and they're like, "Well, why are you doing reuse?" Um, it might be defined in a plan. Um, but around drought contingency, which is what the Bureau is combating right now, you know, they want uh, communities to prepare um, for drought. Uh, we would get no points if, if we didn't have something we could tweak into a drought contingency plan. Don, you have a question? Um, yeah, I think kind of a comment more than a question. Um, I just wanted uh, people to consider how big of an impact the uh, city of Flagstaff and its water use has on the uh, surrounding areas. Uh, there are a lot of people that depend on hauled water uh, in the surrounding areas from the city of Flagstaff. There are subdivisions or other water companies uh, in and around Flagstaff that are or potentially could be impacted by the city's uh, uh, continued development of water supplies for the community plus or 
uh, to make up for a loss of water supply in one part of their portfolio. So one of the things that I think that the city of Flagstaff ought to be considering as, you know, as part of a overall drought contingency is how the community might interact with those water users in the surrounding area and potentially uh, provide them uh, with additional uh, with additional water resources that would allow them to uh, you know better stand a uh, extended drought. Um, John Nama here. Um, Aaron, could you? I noticed you had a little bullet line about potable reuse uh, master plan. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? I uh, drought contingency planning, you know, should utilize it, it, well. The, our water policies point us to uh, using all of our resources to the best of our ability. So, um, you know, determining. Uh, how we want to use our recycled water into the future is, is something we need to vet out so that we understand um, how it's combating drought, if that makes sense. We have this opportunity to um, recycle 100% of our water uh, that isn't committed. So it's important we continue pursuing that. Yeah, no, I think that's really important. I think this overall uh, looking at this uh, drought contingency strategies is critical for Flagstaff. Um, yeah, I think and you know. I think we should really put emphasis on, you know, essentially IPR and DPR. Um, this bullet point. Um, because, you know, we can get over 50%, whatever our potable usage is or our we can get 50% of that back at least or more in for potable availability, which is incredibly a uh, huge asset in terms of uh, drought mitigation. So, um, but it, I mean, it would take a lot of elements in terms of during drought times, that's when you usually have maximum use of reclaimed water. Uh, if we're using IPR, that alleviates that issue a little bit. Um, but uh, we also need to look at uh, in terms of our that maximum use of reclaimed and of maximum use of potable during those, you know, the periods of May and June when we just have our, our highest level of use, how we can lower that um, before we have drought. So, you know, preparing for a drought strategy is, you know, preparing to con to lower that that peak usage down during those times too. I think so. That should be included in this strategy. Okay. And just out of curiosity, I just a couple more quick questions. Um, one: Where is Canyon del Rio? This new well, I'm I'm not sure where that is, the location is for that. It's an off of Fourth Fourth and Butler near the county. Um, gosh, we used to have the dog pound well, and I hate the Humane Society. Uh, okay. It's, it's kind of near Fox Glen and Sanawa Wells, right. um, but a up little from, up gradient. Just up up above the Rio, right there. Y yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now I remember. Uh, and just uh, what's the current status of uh, Lake Mary? How close are we to not being able to use surface water out of Lake Mary right now? I think we have Brian on here, but I believe it's 24% fall. And at 20 per, tw 19 or 20 percent, we have to reduce how much volume we can pull uh, down to 500 million gallons a day or something like that. I have it right here. Brad has his hand up, so maybe he knows. Yeah, so it's either either the city reduces or communicates to, I believe it's the the, the partners in that agreement. That stipulation was the Forest Service uh, and the city can draft it down farther. But it's, I believe, yeah, it's 24 or 25 percent. The city right now produces about a million, about three million gallons a week out of that, out of the uh, 
out of the uh, Lake Mary, Upper Lake Mary right now. So, so do we hear? How does that agreement work? Um, if if we say declare a drought emergency, can we take more of that water, or is there a con contingency, or we should we have a contingency like that? So, it is built into that agreement, that stipulation from two thousand one, I believe. Uh, I just. It's been a while since I've looked at it, so I'm going completely off memory. Uh, but there is a trigger, and I believe it is at 20 percent, uh, where the city can, uh, if need, to continue to use that supply. There's a process that goes through to notify uh, at least the Forest Service, if not the Park Service. Those are the three, and the city are the three parts of that stipulation. I was, we just I, notify I, them, and I forget. Yeah, unless you have that handy, if it's where they dev get that, or we can provide that in in you know outside of this agree uh, discussion if needed or if interest. I think I said something about a 500 number. Uh, we're limited to four million gallons a day below 19% full, so it would take this six MGD down to four, and then there's another lower tier where we're not allowed to pull from the lake unless it's an emergency and we have to. Like Brad okay. said, then we talked to the Forest Service. Right. Okay, so I guess those stipulations would be in the this uh, contingency plan then. So, yeah, and that's kind of John. If I can just kind of finish my thought, that's when I mentioned uh, you, you talked about reducing peak use. Remember, and I, I talked about how this plan kind of brings in elements of others. So the peak use would be like out of the water conservation plan. I mentioned the reuse plan, Aaron actually had it. Here's the potable reuse plan. So it, it this kind of brings a lot of the various other types of plants all together uh, under the guise of a drought. Yeah, that, that's super. That's great. Yep. Any other questions or comment for Aaron? I have one question, Mr. Robert Dilding. Uh, it, it, to get to where it's a, an alert for a drought, uh, is there any requirement or do we do any projection? Because, I mean, it's pretty simple. You get so much rainfall, you have so much ground water you're pumping and you're reclaiming. Um, the usage, like in this city, has been growing because of more people coming in. I would think it would be something we could probably uh, forecast. And I just wanted to do, is that our responsibility or should it be our responsibility? And if it's not, then who does it fall to? Because um, I wouldn't want to, be, I would say it'd be an advantage for the city to be forecasting that over relying on a county or the state, so. Um, that's my question. We do uh, some forecasting. Uh, water production takes a look at their supplies and, and they forecast, you know, the production outlook for the year. Um, and, you know, I do some forecasting. Um, I think we used to do a lot more forecasting when there was more uncertainty. And now we have so many years of data and our, our water use and demand keeps kind of, it basically stays steady now as we add more people. So we do a little bit of forecasting, but I would say there's, I don't know, Brad, maybe you wanna add something else, but I don't see a real need for like a lot of forecasting <laughs> anymore. I just, just the reason I was, because I said we, in the west here we've been in a drought like california's been in drought for seven or eight years maybe more and i don't know if this particular country part of the country is considered in that group but i just thought that would it wouldn't catch us by surprise if we're if we're really looking at it hard and um and taking all the factors into consideration we Definitely would never at we would never get caught you know yeah, snow snowpack is a concern, and we are forecasting changes in for in snowpack and how that will influence our groundwater sources. So that is a a big one. Um, yeah, so that's been kind of that's been uh, less year after year for the last twenty years, right? Snowpack. So so yeah, Commissioner Dilla, let me help you with that. So 
So first of all, it would be the city. There wouldn't be any other jurisdiction, I think, up in northern Arizona, at least, that's involved in that. Uh, so I think that's a good thing. Another thing that Aaron mentioned I really want to emphasize in the report that staff gives to this commission every year is that we go through a forecasting of how much water we think water production could produce from each of its supplies. And we go to the level of detail so much that at the beginning of the year, we forecast how much surface water we think and then project at the end of the year how much lake water will be remaining in Upper Lake Mary. So the city is very, or I should say the utility water services is very uh, uh, proactive in, in uh and managing and, and, and if you will, annual forecasting, not, not multi-year out forecasting. Although we do that with groundwater models, that's uh, uh, a little different, but uh, we do that with groundwater modeling. Um, so in terms of this conversation, I think uh, the great resource is uh, the report that the staff gives to you every year, which I believe you haven't received the 2022 yet, but I think you're going to soon, but you can go back to last year's and see what was projected then. Okay, that's great. Um, how close have we, when you project it with all that detail, do you check how the reality to the um, um, the forecast at the first of the year? How has it been pretty, pretty accurate? Uh, it's amazing how well water production, uh, since we know the bathymetry of the lake, they know the vault, which is the shape of the bottom of the lake. We know how much they use and how much it drafts uh, per uh, per foot, per how many acre feet they deliver or treat MGD million gallons a day. Uh, they do a really good job, and we do check it every year to see how close we were. Uh, and it really is a target of if they assumed eight billion gallons, I'll just use that number for the year. And if they hit 8 billion, they're pretty good at coming in at that number. If they use less, then the lake's a little higher. If they end up having to use more, it's a little mm -hmm. lower. But yeah, and this is the one of the pages that provides that level of specificity and data in that report. Thank you, I, I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. Yep. Okay, Commissioner Riddell, you have a question? I do, I have a, a, a comment um it any of these could be questions but i'll phrase it as a comment um so so to the the issue of why we need to do this um i think a question that should be asked uh, and I, I presume the answer to this is is in the affirmative but the question that should be asked is uh, legally speaking from the perspective of the Arizona Department of Water Resources and from the perspective of the state of Arizona's regulators um, do we have any insight into whether having an official approved formal drought management plan is a good thing or a bad thing in the foreseeable future right so having 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 a Having a drought plan that's a part of our strategic plan that isn't an official approved drought management plan is different in our state in, in some very specific ways um, that could help us or hurt us legally speaking in the future. So I, I suggest that if it hasn't been done already, um, we have council or whoever take a look into that issue of, of whether having something like that um, could uh, help us or hurt us legally. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I assume, because we're having this discussion, I assume the, you already think the answer is that it will help us. Um, th there's a couple of other um, comments, though, as to why we might want such a thing. Um, first, um, it's, it's much, much better to have um, negotiated the rules for crisis management beforehand um, before people are under pressure of the moment. Uh, because once you get into the moment, politics comes into play more um, and people's self-interest comes into play more. And, um, and, and it also becomes um, hard there tends to be a bias toward the status quo, toward doing nothing um, in the crisis of the moment. And, and so um, having a prearranged plan 
uh, that everyone has already seen and agreed to long before it becomes an issue can really help us to do the right thing without a lot of delay um, and without um, special interests stepping in and uh, unduly influencing the process. Um, so so I'm, I'm a big fan of having a prearranged water supply or a drought plan of some kind. I think that's a great reason. Um, a second reason why it's a really good idea is that um, one of the jobs of government, uh, in this case, the city government, is to create predictability and certainty for people so that they can make investment decisions and business decisions accordingly. Um, so and a great example was already brought up, which is the issue of hauling water, right? So if I was buying a property or, or doing any kind of development in the greater Flagstaff area, uh, I would really like to know before I make those d investment decisions what the city plans on doing about hauled water in the event of a drought. That might affect my decision about whether to drill a well or whether to um, build within an incorporated part of the city so I have access to the water. Um, this, is a, this is a serious problem where uncertainty or lack of communication of, of what is going to happen um, could create malinvestment, right? So this is another good reason to have a clearly communicated plan that everybody knows about. If everybody knows the rules of the game, they can make good, uh, good private decisions about how to invest in water or not, right? Um, let's see, was there something else? I, th I, I think that's probably enough. I'm, I'm generally a fan of it. Um, I think you want to have these discussions before. Oh, the last thing, um, and now I remember, and this gets to the questions about who's forecasting drought um, or, or how do we know when a drought's going to happen. Um, my understanding of the way this should be done is that, and, and one of the most important features of a drought plan is that it actually defines in a very accurate and useful way, a very unambiguous way and a forecastable way and a measurable way, what the drought is, right? So in other words, we define what drought is for our community. On Lake Mead, drought's defined as certain levels um, getting crossed on the reservoir storage, right? Um, but we would need to define what does drought mean for our community? What are the different stages of drought? How do you know when we've entered them? And that keeps people from arguing as the drought is happening, arguing about whether the drought is happening, right? Because it's very clear that it's some groundwater level or Lake Mary level or something um, that triggers uh, the drought contingency. So um, then people can do their own forecasting and plan accordingly. So um, that's one of the things it would do. Am I getting that right, um, Aaron? I think you made, you know, great supporting points for, for why this is important. And I've already drafted a plan and submitted it with the application. So uh, if there's concern that this is taking away from other work, I do already have a draft plan in place. Thank you, Commissioner Dillon. Any, any other questions? Um, Aaron, I, I have a, for, for Brad, uh, we did get an electronic copy of the report to the Water Commission, but we haven't got hard copies yet, just so he's aware. Um, I was wondering about how we manage Upper Lake Mary water and whether if, if we're in a forecasted drought year, uh, if there's a balance between, you know, the, the main thing is peak usage during uh, those hot months. Uh, if we should keep a, a larger reserve in Upper Lake Mary, or if that's been a consideration to mediate possible problems, especially now that we've lost the interbasin water source for temporarily, I don't know what the situation is up there. Um, do, you, do you see what I'm saying? 
So yeah. I, there may be some thinking along those lines. John, John, if I could ask Mr. O'Keefe to mute, we're getting a lot of feedback. I think it's coming from you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Um, Brad, you came on, so I'll let you take the question. So, so John, there, so the water production does take that into account. I still hear the, uh, I don't think Mr. O'Keefe has silenced that. Um, and th thank you. And then there are, um, there, from a water production standpoint, right now, there's some operational challenges that they have that they have backed off. I'm not sure if they backed off all of what they can, but they, in meaning in terms of one day, three days mil making a million gallons a day for three million a week, uh, they have to keep the treatment plant, what the term is, wet. <laughs> So at any given time, they can turn it on if they need to uh, it, uh, more than what they like for a peak peak week. Let's say we lose we lose a well field and they need to run the plant at six million gallons a day and not three million gallons a week. So there's some there's a little bit of balance there. Uh, uh, so they do consider uh, the elevation in the lake both today and then as again, I mentioned what the prediction is at the end of the year based off of how much they think they're going to produce. Thank you, Brad. Yeah. Okay, any other comments? I've just got one. one but... So, so Brad and Aaron, I think I, I favor this approach, but I just want to be really clear in my mind, our strategic water plan should be drought based. We should always be looking at the fact that we are going to have, or just planning on having less instead of more. And so that we don't, I, I want to avoid the department and the city having something that's sort of like, well, here's nominal and it's all good, but just in case a drought happens, here's this thing that we use. I think it's the other way around. <laughs> we're, 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 we're in a long-term macro drought and this is how we're effectively going to manage everything. And, and here's, here's when you put all the pieces together, here's how it, how it looks as to drought or let's call supply, supply deficit planning. So that there is one crisp document that has all that together for the city, for the county, state, fed. So I, it's just a, I, I, I've seen this before where plans were put together and there's this sort of this, oh yeah, we pull this out once in a while if we have a problem, but it's not really the heart of the planning. And I think that's got to be the case for the city and anybody in the Northwest or Southwest, excuse me. So with, with that, I think you're, Aaron, you're looking for a uh, basic nod from the commission to continue this work and, and develop this and come back around. So at this point, Mary, it might be appropriate just to do a quick roll call of, of support, either yay or nay, through the commissioners. Can you please lead that? Should you we are say looking yes? for approval, Aaron? Yes, yeah, support. Okay. So, Commissioner um, Loveridge, yes, no. I don't see. Commissioner Alter, uh, what was the question? Malcolm, do you can do you uh, support? Yeah. continuing the effort on this to put this document together. Yes, absolutely. Commissioner Nauman. Uh, yes, I support it. And if Aaron, if you would uh, forward your PowerPoint you just gave to us to the commissioners, I would appreciate that. But very strong, yes. Commissioner Ruddle. Yes. Commissioner Dilday. Yes, thank you. Commissioner Bales. Yes. And Commissioner Regelman. Yes. OK, all in favor. All right, Aaron. <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone. Excellent, thank you.
Okay, let's move on to item. Give us the update on that. So, Ed. Good afternoon again. Uh, my computer is lagging, so I apologize if this is a little slow. Um, I'll try to share my screen. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon. We have an informational item today. This is the Schultz Creek flood mitigation. Um, we'll be walking through this uh, number of slides. Hopefully, there's some questions, comments at the back or at the end, I should say. Uh, hey, Ed, what, Ed, you may want to put it into uh, slide mode, slideshow mode. Just make it so bigger. The slides bigger. Yeah. Sure. Can do. All right. Is that better? Super. OK, so a quick overview. We'll talk about the pipeline fire, uh, the flood risk in Schultz Creek, the mitigation strategy we're bringing to you today, uh, the cost and benefits of that mitigation, and then uh, some discussion if needed. Um, so I'll move through this pretty quickly. I think everybody is very familiar with pipeline fire at this point. Uh, this slide shows you uh, kind of an aerial view from Google Earth of the various fires that we've had recently and their um, footprint. So 2019, the museum fire that drains in mostly into spruce wash uh, that goes through the Sunnyside neighborhood. Uh, the 2010, 2022 uh, tunnel fire and pipeline fire that all impacted the east side of the community, Sedoni Park area, uh, and then the west side of the pipeline fire that impacted uh, what we call the Chimney Springs watershed and also Schultz Creek. Um, so pipeline fire, about 25,000 acres, um, roughly 1,000 acres of that fire is within Schultz Creek. Uh, Schultz Creek watersheds, roughly 4,000 acres. We're talking about 25% of the watershed uh, that has been impacted. Uh, this is an aerial view of some of that impacted area. Uh, quite a bit of the area was burned in moderate or severe soil burn severity, SBS. Uh, that's the, what we're looking at when we're looking at flood uh, potential. So basically how strong that soil burns really drives the, the flood conversation. Uh, another map kind of similar, we're showing here that SBS map. So the, the reds and oranges, yellows, those are the moderate and severe uh, soil burn severity. And then you get into those more green colors, which are either low or unburned. So we had quite a bit of severe burn within the Shoals Creek. The, the Shoals Creek watershed is the blue lines that you see here. That the smaller sliver is the Chimney Springs watershed. And then what's in the middle of the, of the screen is the Shoals Creek watershed. Off to the right, uh, where it says government tank, kind of pixelated. Uh, that's the Weatherford um, Canyon area. Uh, seen some pretty severe impacts over on the east side uh, already. Uh, so shortly after the fire, actually during the fire, uh, both the county and the city uh, worked through J.E. Fuller Hydrology and Geomorphology to put together a flood risk model and map. Uh, this is what's been done previously for the 2010 Schultz fire and also for the 2019 Museum fire using a flow 2D model. It's a two dimensional uh, numeric model. Um, that can look at that soil burn severity and, and assign a value um, for the flood that we might see. Uh, what the slides will be showing you today, this is a design storm based on a two inch rain event over the entire Schultz Creek watershed in 45 minutes. Uh, that roughly calculates out in terms of recurrence interval to be uh, somewhere between a 25 and 50 year recurrence interval, or if you want to do it in proportions or percentage, uh, a two to four percent percent uh, percent storm per year. Sorry about that. Uh, what we're looking at here with the colors are your water depths in feet. Uh, Schultz Creek here is on the far right of the screen. You can see the North Reservoir, um, the two tanks there along Schultz Pass Road, uh, and then this is draining from obviously Schultz Pass down behind the Museum of Northern Arizona. Uh, as it comes down through that area, um, again, this is a two inch model, comes down to Highway 180. Uh, we have a culvert there that uh, does not have much capacity. 
Um, so what we show is, is overtopping at that culvert, which time it then goes down Highway 180. Some of that spills through the Stavana Way neighborhood and then into Coconino Estates. Uh, on the left here, you see the Rio de Flag. It shows some flow here because we're all also modeling that flow out of Chimney Springs. So that flow that you're seeing within the, the channel of Rio de, the Rio de Flag is from that other watershed. Uh, slightly different uh, situation here than we have for Museum Fire. Uh, the Grandview and Sunnyside neighborhoods and Spruce Wash uh, tend to drain fairly well. It's essentially a north to south drainage allows it to flow through uh, relatively efficiently and then uh, leave the neighborhood rather rather quickly. Uh, if you look at this map here, you can see sort of um, what we're calling this bathtub effect within Stavana Way, where we have these low areas, these depressions uh, that allow for ponding and allow for, uh, for it to pond for quite a while. Moving further downstream, uh, this is upper and lower Coconino Estates. You can see once it gets past that original ponding area near Stavana, uh, it starts going through most of the roads. There is some overtopping, uh, a handful of houses they're expected to see um, some sheet flow uh, issues as the water tries to make its way back into the Rio de Flag. Uh, we stopped the modeling uh, at the lower portion of Coconino Estates, and the reason for that is as we go further down into the neighborhoods, uh, we're getting more and more of a, of a contributing uh, effect and con contributing area of the Rio de Flag itself. So the Rio de Flag uh, has essentially, or approximately, I should say, uh, a watershed area of about 57 square miles, uh, which is quite a bit larger than that Schultz Creek contributing area. So as we move further and further downstream, the modeling becomes more and more uncertain as we have a larger watershed area. And uh, essentially, as you know, we don't usually have monsoon storms that would cover an entire 57 square mile area. So it gets to the point where um, it becomes academic to do a modeling exercise. To have a true design storm that works um, becomes a little less uh, realistic. So what we decided to do downstream into the, the downtown and south side neighborhoods is to take a look at the volume of water we're expecting out of Schultz Creek and then take a look at the, the FEMA map, so the FEMA floodplain map and the anticipated flood volumes that you can see in that 2010 study by FEMA and just determine what that flood risk would be approximately for downtown and south side. Um, so we do expect an ele elevated flood risk in those areas due to obviously the increased flood volume out of Schultz Creek. So at the moment, what, we're, what we are messaging is that that footprint would be within both the 100 year and 500 year FEMA floodplain. And that's what we're looking at here. Uh, the blue is the 100 year floodplain, the zone AE, uh, if you're in FEMA parlance. Uh, and then that kind of orange color is the FEMA X, uh, that would be the 500 year floodplain. Uh, so what we are managing for is for uh, a greater flood risk in those areas. Um, so in terms of overall flood risk and impacts from the pipeline fire on the west side, uh, we can do a quick GIS exercise of you know, what's impacted within the Schultz Creek watershed and then also what's impacted within that FEMA floodplain for both downtown and south side. Uh, and you have the numbers here, it's 100, 126 public parcels, 131 commercial, 667 residential, some vacant land, uh, quite a bit of historic overlay, uh, mostly in the downtown south side area. Uh, overall uh, property value is in the roughly 600 to 700 million uh, range. So one of, the, one of the mitigation strategies and why we're here today, um, we quickly got together with you know, some of the planners, the hydrologists, the engineers, uh, and sat down and really started working through uh, quickly as the fire is burning, what are our opportunities to help mitigate um, this, this really uh, quite large impact that we, we see that, that's going on. And something that really came up pretty quickly um, was the city owned 20 acre open space parcel near the Schultz Y or what we call the Schultz Y. Uh, this is upstream of any development. Uh, it's, it's relatively flat. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty good opportunity to mitigate quite a bit of the flood impacts uh, before we get to the city. Uh, 
property currently has several resource overlays, including uh, landmark overlay, <clears throat> open space, rural floodplain, uh, to, to speak to a few. Um, we do anticipate that flood impacts will drastically change the character of that 20 acre parcel, regardless of what we do. Um, and mitigation improvements on this parcel will mitigate most of the anticipated flood impacts downstream. Uh, we are approaching this through a federal grant. Uh, it's a rather different one than, than most of our federal grant processes. Uh, this is an NRCS EWP exigency grant. So what that is, is an emergency watershed protection grant through the NRCS. Uh, it's provided for private land uh, that is impacted by fires on federal lands. Um, so we can work through that. It's a very uh, narrow focus of what they will fund. Uh, this is one of those things that they would fund. Um, and it has a very strict timeline because it is exigency, which means that it is an emergency. The reason that we are approaching it is because we have a dire need. Um, with that, again, if you're not familiar with that 20 acre parcel, this is the, a quick site map on the left. You can see it in that sort of magenta color. Uh, kind of near the Cheshire neighborhood, upstream of the Coconino States neighborhood. Uh, on the right is just um, a generalized uh, footprint of the detention basins we are going to talk about uh, with that landmark overlay around them, which enc encompasses the entire 20 acre parcel. Uh, again, going back to uh, some of the comment I had earlier, if we do nothing, this parcel will still be uh, drastically impacted. So here we're showing the three inch rain event, which is about a 100 year rain event. So a larger rain event. And you can see that there's quite a bit of inundation uh, on that parcel. Um, some examples of what those impacts might look like on the left, we can see uh, over a foot of deposition, sediment deposition in the Pocky Trails area. On the right, we can see some of the deposition that we've seen in the Spruce Wash area and in the Humane Society. Uh, an aerial view of some of the Weatherford drainage issues uh, the county is working with right now uh, from this year. Um, so the, the area is going to be drastically impacted one way or another, whether it's through uh, natu nature or whether it's through our own work to help mitigate. Um, so this is the design as it sits right now. It's, it's actively being um, modified by our design uh, engineer. That would be uh, Shepard Westminster, SWI. Uh, what we are attempting to mitigate is uh, approximately a little more than 40 acre feet of uh, flood and sediment and debris volume coming down off of the mountain. Uh, so this would be a series of three inline detention basins um, with a um, sediment and debris capture uh, inlet. So this would be a terminal trench similar to the terminal trenches that the county has uh, designed and implemented both in the museum fire area as well as in the Schultz fire area. Uh, and then a bleed through with a series of pipes and overflow structures before it gets back into the Schultz channel. Uh, here you can kind of see some of the cut and fill that we're talking about. This will be a, a fairly large project in terms of cut and fill. We are talking about uh, several feet of cut as well as several feet of fill in terms of berms around those three detention basins. Uh, side slopes will generally be around three to one to four to one depending on location. Uh, so there will be a pretty good ingress and egress for you know public safety. Not that we really want people in these basins anyway. Uh, so project benefits. On the left here on the upper left, I have a uh, a table of the three different uh, design storms that we've run through J.E. Fuller. So the one inch, two inch, and three inch in 45 minutes, uh, what those storm frequencies are. So roughly the two to five year event for a one inch, uh, a greater than 25 year for a two inch, and a greater than 100 year for a three inch event. Uh, and then the two columns to the right of that is our benefits. So the first one is the percent decrease in peak flow. So I just was running it through uh, heck HMS, which is uh, allows us to give uh, detention volume and an outflow inflow and outflow um, uh, model for the improvements of this uh, of this series of basins. So the percent decrease in peak flow for the one inch is pretty dramatic, up an 80% decrease in peak flow. 
that goes down to roughly 60% for the two inches is also very good. And a 20% decrease in peak flow for that extremely large event. Uh, and then percent decrease in flood severity. So that's looking at what the downstream culverts can take. So uh, assuming that you know the culverts are gonna be open and taking flow, um, all flows contained on the one inch event. Um, without mitigation, there is overtopping with the one inch at Highway 180. It's relatively minor, but there is overtopping that goes all the way through uh, Coconino States before it uh, returns to the Rio. Uh, more impressively, and what we really are shooting for is that two inch event. And we see that 70% of that flood severity is, is taken out of the equation with this mitigation strategy. Uh, which means that we have some minor overtopping, uh, somewhat similar to the one inch event uh, where we'll have water on Highway 180, but we do not expect to have uh, severe ponding in Stavana Way or severe over um, topping through Coconino State. So dramatically improve uh, the flood conditions right now within a year of the fire, which would be tremendous. Uh, and then a three inch event, we have 25% decrease in flood severity. That sounds uh, not very impressive, but when we're talking about the very large amount of water that we're talking about, a 25% decrease in a 100 year flood is a, is a huge improvement. It's a really big deal. Uh, and then down below is just a screenshot from that HEC HMS model. Uh, the dashed line is a hydrograph uh, with time. Uh, for one of the events, you can see that high peak flow, and then the, the solid line is the outflow uh, based on the mitigation structure. So same volume of water, obviously, it's detention, not retention, um, but we are metering it out. We're attenuating that flow um, so that we do not have that large peak. Uh, we'll just have a much longer flow at a much more moderate level that the culverts and the channel can take. Um, the mitigation design will allow for multiple uses, trail access, for example, trailheads. Uh, historical interpretation of the site will be included as uh, were required uh, due to the cultural mitigation. So it'll probably be interpretation of, of the city's first water reservoir, which is within that 20 acre parcel, as well as possibly Beale Wagon Road, which goes near the parcel. Um, as I mentioned, the design will reduce flood impact substantially for the neighborhoods of Coyote Springs, Coconino Estates, and then also downtown and south side. Uh, will, the design will drastically reduce life and safety threats, obviously, as mentioned. Uh, and then as we're talking right now, NRCS has conducted their historic clearances. Uh, the cultural clearances, we have some work still to do at the state level. So the federal level, we are good to go. State level, we're working through that right now. Environmental clearances are being conducted right now through NRCS, and then uh, the city will work through the Section 404 clearance uh, with the Army Corps. So we have a meeting about that tomorrow. Um, if funded, again, this is a very interesting grant. It is exigency. So if funded, the city will have 10 days to complete the work from the time of grant approval. We have submitted for an extension of up to 90 days. Uh, we are pretty confident that we are, will get that uh, just based on conversations today. Uh, but either way, it's going to be a very tight timetable, uh, with some uh, impressive amount of work that needs to go into it, um, whether it's 10 days or 90 days. A uh, quick cost benefit analysis, uh, if folks are interested. Uh, we cost this out to be approximately $3.2 million uh, based on our engineers' opinion of probable cost. Most of that will be federal funding, 75% uh, NRCS with a 25% city match. We are uh, hoping to, to uh, submit that 25% city match to DFFM, that's the State Department of Forest and Fire Management. Um, for uh, reimbursement of that 25% match. It is eligible since uh, this is a, uh, also a fire that's uh, of interest for at, the, at the state level, sorry. Uh, looking at the benefit, we're looking at a federal risk assessment that puts a benefit at approximately $50 million uh, based on substantial flood risk reduction. Now that benefit and the cost, these are very narrow scopes. We're only talking about property risk and construction, so construction costs for the cost and the benefit is really just looking at property value. So we're not talking about uh, life safety, 
we're not talking about public infrastructure impacts uh, or quality of life. So just a very simplified uh, BCA analysis here. Uh, if you take those other um, variables into account, the BCA is even better or even more favorable, I should say. So either way, we're much greater than the typical federal uh, threshold of a one to one BCA. Uh, we're over an order of magnitude above that. And I just kind of ran through those slides very quickly, but if anybody has any questions, uh, definitely here to um, take those or comments. Ed, uh, this is John Nauman. I have a boatload of questions, so I'll try and be brief. Uh, great work. This is incredible to have this put together in such a short time frame. Uh, and it's right where I thought it should go. So <laughs> good work. Um, uh, just some just some quick questions. The ring gauges uh, that you have set up, are they real time? We have we have both. Um, actually, no, that's not true. For ring gauges, they're all real time. Uh, real time. Stream, okay. stream gauges are different. So right. ring gauges are real time. They are radio telemetry, so they send a signal up to uh, Devil's Head, so Mount Eldon, and then that signal is transmitted to City Hall as well as uh, to J.E. Fuller. So both their, the J.E. Fuller office here in Flagstaff, which they run for the Coconino County, as well as their Tempe office. So if I watching the 15 minute window and I see half an inch of rain in that 15 minute window on the burn scar, how long is it gonna take that water to hit 180, approximately? <laughs> That's a, that's a great question, and, and I can I can give you several answers. Uh, it really depends on the watershed, and right. so when I say that, I'm talking about not the burn part. I'm talking about the unburned section that we have. So, for example, when we had a little bit of flow last week, uh, we had one inch on one of the gauges, and and zero essentially on, on another one of the gauges within the Schultz Creek watershed. Uh, that took over two hours to go from the burn scar uh, where we, we drove up there and actually watched it start, initiate, um, down to Highway 180. Now, you have to put a rather large asterisk on that because that took two hours because it was going through quite a bit of uh, virgin channel that had not been smoothed out, had still a very large mannings and or roughness coefficient, um, still quite a bit of vegetation in the way, etc. Uh, same thing that we saw in Museum Fire and same thing that we saw at Schultz Fire for those that are around for that. Um, those first few flushes tend to be pretty slow. Now, once we start getting um, a few more through there and we start getting that roughness down, you know, there's enough ash, there's enough sediment that's within the channel to, to speed it up. We no longer have willows in the way and a bunch of down logs, uh, then it will speed up. And uh, the exact time, it's, it's going to be hard to say, uh, depending on the storm, uh, but it probably will be a lot longer than what we've seen in museum fire, uh, just due to the distances. Uh, so spruce wash with museum fire, you know, that started um, roughly taking an hour to get to the city. And by last year, when we had rapid fire events, uh, it got down to the point where it was about half an hour. So if we're going to use that same sort okay. of proportionality, maybe an hour if we get down to that. Do we do we have a way? I'm sure there's a way to send out an alert uh, on the emergency um, system. Yeah, so we have what's called a flood director protocol, and this is uh, set up by both the county and the city. So where we look at the radio, the, the gauges, the rain gauges, uh, we also have cameras up in the forest. Now for Schultz Creek, we only have one camera uh, just due to the bad reception up there. Uh, Museum Fire, we have several. Um, but we do have people that are staffed up for each one of these events. When they see it, they hit certain thresholds, then they'll make those uh, alerts. So we have both what the county alert, the rave system. Uh, that's what usually you see on your phone. And then the National Weather Service is also plugged in. Uh, and they have the National Weather Service alert. So there's two levels of uh, flash flood alerts that you may see. Okay, that that that's comforting. I've had many people ask me about this. That's why I asked the question. Um, could you go back to the point in your slides, the second slide where you're showing 
the heart of Coconino, that one that shows the intersection of 180 with uh, Schultz Creek. So if you look at that picture, is there any way we can that the city can quickly change this pattern so that you see there's a small amount of water getting into the Rio? Have, I'm sure you guys have looked at this, but isn't there a way we can quickly make a channel that that water can get into the Rio instead of going through Coconino Estates? Yeah, so the issue here, um, well, one, there's private property. So there's a couple parcels that are private that we have to go through uh, either an appraisal, condemnation, whatever to, to get access for it. Uh, and then the other issue is we still have to expand the culvert under Highway 180, which would be an ADOT project. Um, so it's definitely on our radar uh, and we definitely have uh, designs moving forward as we speak in terms of uh, concept, moving that to 30% design of, you know, what would that culvert look like uh, being expanded and then how would we move it from the other side of the culvert to the Rio. Uh, what's not really shown here very well is it, the culvert's interesting right now. It doesn't go directly under 180 and then directly to the Rio. It goes partially under 180 and then it follows down the highway um, past the fire station and then it cuts underneath Stavano Way um, as a separate pipe. So it actually makes two turns before it makes it to the Rio. Um, so it is a kind of a convoluted system right now, uh, and we are working through the design process for a long term mitigation. But yeah, it's definitely high on our list. It's not as high as that 20 acre parcel, uh, which I think we can move on very quickly, but it's definitely something that we're going to look into um, very seriously as the next step. OK, I think this might be the last question. So if we have a two inch right now. Is it going to take out 180? I don't think, I mean, uh, by take out, do you mean it's going to scour it out? I, I don't think so. Um, this is a water depth map. It doesn't show velocity. Um, because there's a lot of velocity in that water, not very far above that. It's going down a hill in that red portion right there. It is, and then you're going to have a backwater effect when you reach the highway. So the velocity map, which I don't have here to share easily, um, it really does drop off pretty quickly. So what we're expecting along Highway 180 is uh, fairly fast moving water, but it's nothing like you'd see, uh, you know, at Linda Vista or Grandview. Yeah, if you're yeah under a Grandview videos. event. Yeah, OK. Yeah, it's not, it's not just, quite the same. Yeah, but, but it's, there's going to be a lot of deposition of mud and debris on 180 for sure. Most likely. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't want to say definitely, but very, very likely. OK, all right. Uh, I might have a couple more, but I'll let other people ask. OK, thank Mr. you. Alter, Commissioner Alter, you're, you're next. Yeah, just so everybody knows that um, we did look into uh, back in the past. We set the fire station back in order to run that culvert. And Ed may know this, but if he doesn't, in the file somewhere, there's a concept design already uh, to extend the culvert under 180 uh, we made the fire station set back to provide for an open channel adjacent to that. We worked with the property owner. I won't name any names, but there is only one property owner. Uh, we had a con there is a concept designed for a channel that runs through his property. Uh, and then it kind of all fell apart when at the last minute he said, well, now wait a minute, what's in it for me? And I said, we don't have any money. And he said, never mind. So that's kind of where that st that stood. I don't know, obviously, if it's changed, but that's just background. I think it's for Ed. I don't know if you already knew that, but uh, just background information. That's all. Yeah, thanks, Malcolm. I, I did know that, but it's it's good information for everybody else. OK, Commissioner Riddell. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I apologize in advance if I missed something here. Um, so, so I thought that I thought there was a question asked about whether we could like change the channel or get some of the water into the Rio. 
and I didn't look at the drawings closely enough when they were on screen to, to see, but um, couldn't we just put a, a, a small culvert um, through out of the bottom of the channel through the retention structure so that the, you know, the first, oh, I don't know, um, 100 CFS, you know, gets, gets passed downstream um, so that all those little flows just keep flowing like normal, but, uh, but anything bigger than that gets retained? Or was that included in the design? Or did I totally miss the question? No, you didn't miss that, Ben. Um, it, that is going to be in this design. So what we had to give to NRCS rather quickly and what I'm showing here right now, uh, you know, this is what we call pre-final design. It's it's not final by any means. There's no drainage report attached to it. Um, there's no H&H uh, &H analysis with it, so hydrology and hydraulics. So th that's what SWI is working through right now. But um, yes, it, it will follow that that logic where you know a small flow will just go straight through and you know you you don't really want to spread that out across all three basins um, so that will uh, move through uh, and then as you get to those larger flows that's when it actually starts doing um, what it's intended to do and that's the, the detention portion thanks ed yeah, so I apologize. This is not exact. This is not a final design. So yeah, it's it, you have to kind of interpret it a little bit and just kind of squint, if you will. But no, it's a good question. Ed, I've got a question. This is Kirk. The you mentioned that there's a timeline and a deadline to complete. What's the impact if we don't? Does do we get penalized? Does some of the funding go away? What's what's the net there? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's a question we've had to NRCS. Um, uh, Stacy, if you're on, you might have a better answer than I do, because I know we've been sort of running around um, asking that question. And I don't know if I have the most recent answer from NRCS. Uh, I, can't, I can't see here. I know Stacy Breckler Nags was on earlier. She may not be not now. Um, but that that is a good question. I don't think I have an answer for you at this moment. Uh, that was something we posed back to NRCS uh, of whether it's a, a penalty or, or how that works. Yeah, I think it's important just from a risk management standpoint that we get obviously get that get that understood. So okay, any other questions, Fred? John, any questions? Okay, I, I, I have another uh, question. Perhaps I, I think I might have already talked with you about this at uh, maybe at our the last uh, commission meeting. But um, I know there are sites upstream from this too on Forest Service land that would lend themselves to other structures of a similar type as this. Uh, have you guys talked to the Forest Service about the possibility of doing something? To mitigate an even the three inch event a little bit more or what's the status on that yeah so what we are doing and by we i mean the county and the city we're going to come together and have a coordinated ask of the forest service um so that there is actually a plan to to put in part as part of that ask um some of that alluvial fan restoration type work that we've seen on the other side of the mountain um, that would help drop out some of the sediment and debris before it gets to this series of basins. And then also a series of uh, channel grade control structures. So essentially trying to hold the channel together in areas that are narrow and steep and that look like they have a, a very good chance of incising and transporting sediment. So um, we're working through that right now through natural channel design. That's the uh, point of contact between the county and city. I, I don't have much to share publicly with that right now, but the, there will be an ask of the Forest Service um, soon that will be coordinated by both county and city, and it will include Schultz Creek. Yeah, uh, the one location I was thinking about is right where the uh, the new trail uh, used to start. Uh, there's a big flat area right there. 
and now they've got the Schultz Creek Trail, which is uh, uh, probably the most one of the most iconic trails in northern Arizona, mountain bike trails. Uh, and that's now out of harm's way to uh, at least lower part or the upper part. I can see having a lot of problems, but um, that will be a thing for later probably. But uh, that would be a great site for one of those, I think. Just because Definitely. of the width, yeah. Definitely, yeah. It's it's high on our list um, for for both agencies um, or both governments, I should say. Yeah, we de we've taken a look at that, and in the model also you can see. Not to take up too much time, but let me go find that model again. You can kind of see it a little bit here, even uh, just upstream of the twenty acre parcel. You can see how it spreads out all through there. And if I was to take that back far enough to the other. Well, uh, yeah, here's this one's better. You can yeah. see how that spreads out. Yeah, so that's definitely yeah. high on our list to as an ask. It's already a natural spot for it right there. Yep, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I uh, really appreciate your information. It, it's I, I'm still amazed at how fast you guys have been able to put this together. So thank you. Well, we can sleep in the fall, right? Yeah, that's <laughs> and sleep a lot better next monsoon. <laughs> That's our hope. Uh, yeah, our hope is to really do a lot of meaningful mitigation early so that we don't have to be doing this for years out. You're here. All right, thank you, Ed. I would like to kind of proceed into the next item if there's no major questions, just for time's sake. Okay, so let's hit 4D, which is the reentry plan, hybrid or virtual? Okay, Brad. Yeah, uh, commissioners, uh, Brad Hill. Uh, just a quick uh, introduction to this. There was some conversation uh, after the last meeting about should the Water Commission consider going to similar to what the uh, City Council is doing, meaning a hybrid approach. Uh, we provided, uh, you know, the city went into its uh, phase four reentry plan back in April. Uh, and so I'll just kind of leave it open and throw it out to the commission to discuss. Are you happy to keep it virtual? Would you like to do a hybrid? Uh, we just kind of put it out there for conversation. There's some, uh, as what I provided in the staff summary, you know, there's some commissions that have just remained pure virtual. Uh, so I just put it out there for you for conversation. Anybody well, have any strong feelings yeah. one way or the other? <laughs> Hearing none. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would vote for hybrid just because I think it's important to get face to face, or maybe we get into a rhythm of every other month as hybrid or something. But I don't know the logistics that that pushes on the team, right? In terms of room logistics and IT issues and stuff. So, but I just think it's important we see each other. My, that's my personal. That's Kurt. I think hybrid would be fine also um, just so that we continue to have the uh, remote option available. Uh, that's actually really nice. I've actually been on vacation for at least one or two meetings and that's been useful. So. Uh, this is Don. I've been hearing since I got back from California that Coconino County has moved back into uh, the red territory for COVID. Uh, not sure how true that is, and uh, I would think that the city has a specific, uh, you know, response uh, protocol in place for that that we probably should be following. So, so to answer Don's question, so we are following there, and um, as I mentioned, it's the city's in its phase four, which allows for hybrid meetings, which is why council is at. Uh, currently there. I have not heard and I can look to see if there's any conversation once council restarts, if they're going to change uh, change that or not. But uh, but clearly Water Commission would follow that. I, and, and that's also the well, benefit I of just. If, if, go ahead. Just just to have my voice. I'm a fan of hybrid meetings as well. Several other groups I'm with are already uh, in the hybrid mode. I see the city attorney has his hand up. Yes, thank you, Brad. I appreciate it. Uh, because council is on break right now and they did not pick this up prior to the break, it would either require a special meeting of council or for them 
once they get back to change anything, but I, I don't anticipate seeing anything different than hybrid. Um, that said, you never know. To approach this a little bit differently, does anybody have any objections to hybrid on the commission? Okay, so I think Brad, maybe we, we set up for kick that off August or September, depending on logistics, because I'm sure we got to get a room and permits and all that type of stuff. So, right. So we'll kind of go back to the way the commission was. You know, it used to meet at City Hall on a regular basis. There clearly will be logistics with parking that we'll have to work out. So maybe September might be a good one to target, just to allow staff to kind of. We figure out we may want also, depending uh, uh, as, as uh, Marion reaches out and who's going to attend, she'll probably want to ask. I'm just thinking out loud who's going to attend in person versus hybrid. And if there's only one person that's going to be in person, we may want to just notify that person. So there's yeah, probably some that. logistics. Yeah, so I think September might be a good chance for uh, opportunity to start. Yeah, okay. Yeah, if I Perfect. could add. Um, I'll send out an email. Um, the city clerk is the um, the person we need to go through to get permits for parking. Parking is an issue, and we want to issue. Um, they want to um, provide permits first, so you all won't get tickets as you're parked downtown. Yep, that's always good. <laughs> tickets are okay. bad. Okay, great. Thank you. So let's hit the. Last informational item, which is we were um, a we did hear uh, and Malcolm, thank you, Commissioner Alter for bringing to our attention that the county has essentially doubled the tax on store water at their level. And there's about 5 million going out. And to me, it raises two two issues, which when we talked about earlier is. Um, you know, are we coordinated? Do we understand how they're going to spend our money our being our citizens? And so we need to get with the county and, and I think someone raised also including the forest service into that discussion, which makes sense. And then the second issue, and this is one for um, our council, uh, is my other understanding was that tax didn't exist until 18. And when the county went out and got a third party opinion or just a, a third opinion, independent opinion about the legality of Flagstaff sort of abstaining or excluding itself from their zone. And it never really went to court. It never really, as far as I know, it was pushed or discussed or battled. It just was sort of seems to be accepted. And I don't know the history there. So I don't know, Councilor, if you could give us a little bit of history and maybe some of the city council's perspective on that. Should we be sort of fighting this or should we just you know, demand to understand where that money's going and how we need to coordinate? Right. I, I appreciate the uh, uh, heads up on that. And the, the question is, legally, do they have grounds to do it? And under the law, without going into executive session here, I can state plainly in the black and white letter law of state statute, uh, it is allowed. Um, that begs the question, then why do cities ever opt out? of flood control districts and do their own flood plain management to begin with then. Um, part of the reason is because there just isn't enough in the flood control districts at county levels to go around uh, when it comes to uh, projects within cities and cities want to create their own fee uh, so that they can raise their own funds to address their own flood plain issues within the city, even though the county can charge that tax. It's not in the charging of the tax that it, there is an issue legally. That opinion that was obtained by the county, I had the opportunity to review that, and I can tell you, I think it was a solid opinion that they can assess the tax. The issue then becomes in how are the flood control district dollars expended? How are they spent? What is the process for which the city and projects within the city will um, have the opportunity 
to vie for those funds that are collected across the county. Uh, when I say vie to compete for those funds, if you will. And what is the, the even handed uh, process by which those funds are administrated across the county? Uh, the obvious concern with that is if Flagstaff is the most densely populated city within the county and most of the, the funds uh, from flood control district taxation uh, are uh, basically raised from Flagstaff taxes or taxes on those that reside within the city of Flagstaff and then spend elsewhere, how is that fair? And you can get into under state law, you can get into the creation of zones, which the flood control district has indicated they're not interested in doing. Um, but the next step is then create a process that allows everybody to compete on an even handed basis. That is the ground rules are all the same, that the priorities of the, pro the projects that ri rise to the highest level, the priorities are those that meet the criteria that are set forth. The, the flood control district has never done that. And I'll just be quite honest with you. When this first happened, um, four years ago and everything that has come since with respect to fires, the museum fire, and now the pipeline fire, COVID, everything else has kind of come into the middle of it all. And we do see a lot of tax dollars, flood control district tax dollars raised being expended for the benefit of the city of Flagstaff. So there hasn't been a whole lot of push. There hasn't been a whole lot of political will. I don't, that's as far as I will stray into the, the politics of it. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything further than that because that's really the council's purview. But from a legal perspective, if and when we believe projects are being handpicked throughout the county that are, are not being selected on any kind of a fair, uh, even handed approach, that is when I would prefer to go into executive session with both you and the council in separate meetings, obviously, to talk about an approach on that. Um, it's the expenditure of the, the taxes that is the issue from a legal perspective, not so much the raising of the taxes. I hope that helps. Yeah, that's uh, that's great information. And I do think we need to get together and maybe with subcommittee or, or subset, I should say, to kind of hash this out because it's, it's yeah, it's it's a lot of money. You know, we want to make sure that uh, it's not taxation without representation, <laughs> and that we've got a, a good view on what's going on. So I I, I think we need to talk to you, offline you, to roadmap it. Right, and you just you just raised the phrase that I I kept pounding back when this first came up. It was the classic you know, colonial taxation without representation. This is not fair. Our money's going elsewhere and most of the money is coming from here. Um, and now that it's doubled, uh, I, I think uh, we're going to need to pay very close attention. I will say it again, though, with the museum fire and the uh, pipeline fire, uh, we've seen a lot of that, those flood control dollars going toward those, pro well, especially the museum fire. Pipeline fire that still remains to be seen, but it appears a lot of that flood control district taxation uh, will be going toward that as well. It, it remains to be seen, but uh, like I said, uh, if if and when there there becomes a, a will from this commission to pass a question on to the council and for the council the will on that on that level for them to pick it up, um, that's. Uh, I would definitely be ringing the alarm if I felt like the funds were not being distributed equally. And I haven't had that impression, at least haven't had that reported to me as legal counsel. Uh, one final thing, I apologize for not having my camera on, but when I turn it on, my coverage gets very spotty and the stream breaks up. So um, I'm just the voice from beyond today, sorry. <laughs> no worries. Uh, Commissioner Riddell, you've got a question? Um, more of a, an emphasis point. So I, I think that if if COVID is ending and people are and, and, and fire crisis is ending, people are getting back to work on these things. Um, and if the county is currently doing a pretty even handed job. Um, rather than pushing for late ra rather than waiting until later to resolve this question of process, 
I, I suggest that this is a perfect time for us to resolve the question of process before uh, something really expensive and contentious comes up where the where the process is not clear, right? So I'd rather take a proactive approach and go after it now. Um, so I, I, I think I heard that opinion already expressed by another commissioner and I'd, I'd like to uh, add emphasis my own emphasis to that opinion let's and, let's and take for, care of it now I, I really appreciate that from a legal perspective by all means go for it that really is a question for you as a commission from a, a business perspective if you will um, do you want to put that forward right now as a commission uh, and if you do, by all means, I'll, I'll um, be happy to, to pick it up again if the council takes your direction or your recommendation to pick that back up. That's really where I start to work um, in earnest is once the council gets direction. Yeah, and I think this is a topic we can discuss with Vice Mayor Sweet as our, as our adjunct here and, and really sort of maybe define out and we can come back to this next month. Uh, Commissioner Riddell, to find out what it is we're seeking and have a very crisp de definition there, because I think it's there's a couple of different prongs to this. And then um, the commission, the council can can contemplate that, either approve it or not, or amend it. So. Council member Alter, you have a question? Or excuse me, Commissioner Alter, <laughs> just got a, just got a promotion. Wow, yeah, no, I don't want that job. Um, Hey, Sterling, it's good to hear your voice. It's been a long time. Um, Likewise, Malcolm, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think we need the, the facts first, so I'd like to see it on an agenda. I mean, Sterling said something. He said maybe they have been spending some money. You know, I'm not really convinced. Uh, it's almost like we need the facts. Like, since the inception of the district, they've collected X dollars from the city. And then here comes the, the weird one, right? Or for the benefit of. So if they did spend money in the watershed of the museum fire, then that is definitely f directly for our benefit, right? So now that it's gone to 5 million though, um, looking at their budget a little bit. Oh, by the way, I did make a comment at their, um, the supervisor's meeting, not as a water commission member, as a member of the city of Flagstaff. And I said something to the effect of, you know, the city provides most or ha we provide half, about half of the money uh, into the district. And I said there should be some mechanism uh, whereby the city's involved in the budgeting process, <clears throat> something like that. And that comment was made on email since I was on vacation, but it was read. So when I watched it later, they read the comment. Um, there was no discussion on that whatsoever. They didn't want anything to do do with it. And quite honestly, I think the attitude is. And during that same presentation uh, on the hearing of that of the tax increase, uh, Lucinda said something about, and I can't quote it or uh, generally speak. I'll just say generally speaking, she said that once it reached the city limits, we're done. Uh, so I think what they believe is because there's a, the city of Flagstaff has a stormwater fee, a stormwater fee that they don't feel obligated. They think, hey, you got your own money. We're taking your so what? We're going to go spend it wherever we want. So before we, you know, before we go take it to make a recommendation to council, perhaps uh, to look into this or whatever it might be from from us, the commission. I'd like to get some facts. Uh, I know, Kurt, that you've been trying to get um, uh, somebody from the county to come in and talk to us about this, uh, which I think is a great idea. But before we move forward with the recommendation, um, it seems like we need the facts, like how much money, how much has been spent, what's their budget, you know, so on and so forth. And with that, I'll, I'll go ahead and shut up. Thank you. Yeah, no, Malcolm, I agree. I mean, there needs to be a dialogue first to understand where we are, right, and what, what the potentials are. And if they've already got a plan that lays out, here's how we're going to use this funds and here's how it, it um, benefits or not it, Flagstaff, then we can understand that and make a decision whether we think we need to take more action or not. But yeah, dialogue dialogue definitely has to happen. So so we'll work with Vice Mayor Sweet and 
uh, so maybe your office as well to the extent that that's appropriate to to try to begin the dialogue have it and then see what we need to do so yeah, i think that's logical next steps okay anybody have any other informational items kurt uh, this is john just uh real quick okay. Uh, I was wondering if uh, Ed could send us the Schultz Creek uh, 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 PowerPoint on uh, the detention basin and the plan to all the commissioners. The PowerPoint. Yeah, I can do that. I can see if I can attach to this chat. I don't know if that'll work or not, uh, or I can put it in an email. Yeah, email's fine. Email. All right. Yeah. We'll do. Thank you, Ed. Appreciate it. Ed, if you can email it to me, I'll go ahead and email it out. That was my thought. <laughs> Thanks, Marion. Much appreciated. Okay. Any other topics? All right. Seeing none, then we will adjourn at 606. Wait. Thank you. Wait. Oh, hold on. Oh, one more. We go. Sorry, I'm sorry. Malcolm. Hey, it's Malcolm. I want to give a I just want to give a shout out to Joe Loveridge. I, I don't think he's here tonight, right? But I wanted to go ahead and give him a shout out because he did those maps that uh, Ed presented and uh, they looked really nice to me. So just a shout out to Commissioner Loverich. Excellent. They're very helpful for orienting what, what and where. Okay, any other topics? Going once, going twice. <laughs> Okay, great. So we'll adjourn at 6.06 and thank everybody and thank you to the team for the excellent uh, presentations and the information and, and really the fast action on Schultz and all the other activities that have been going on lately. So thank you all and have a great uh, evening. Thanks all.